السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Welcome back to our third session of our summer Sira series Walking with the Prophet um, So today's uh, session inshallah will cover the lifestyle of the Prophet uh, and as in from the previous uh, series and sessions that we've been going through uh, we've been walking alongside the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on uh, a journey as if we're, we're, we're wanting to get to know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by uh, through the shama'il or through the uh, sublime qualities, the intimate descriptions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we began our journey walking alongside the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, talking about the appearance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, noting his uh, humility, his modesty, and then you know going with him into different gatherings and seeing how we uh, observed his interactions and who he came into contact with and the humility and modesty and his character that just uh, emanated throughout these uh, interactions and, and the standard that they were maintained at. And so today, inshallah, we'll be talking more so with respect to that humility and that humodesty becoming a uh, tangible aspect and becoming something uh, realistic with respect to uh, the Prophet Sallallahu life. And so seeing these uh, qualities manifested in his lifestyle uh, and seeing how the Prophet Sallallahu lived. And so imagine now that we are able to kind of go with the Prophet Sallallahu into the home uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu and we, we have a chance to be able to sit with him there, be able to see his interactions. What does he do during his day? What does his lifestyle kind of consist of? And there's some elements of the lifestyle that we'll inshallah touch upon more in depth in later sessions. And again, uh, just for those of you who've been following along, and if you're new to our journey and coming along with us, um, we're glad to have you, but also letting you know that uh, our uh, primary source and mostly exclusive source that we're working off of is the Shama'il of Imam al-Tirmidhi. So this is a, uh, t uh, you know, seminal text that is accessible online and, and, and in various variations, you know, in, in print as well. So we're, we're just using that as our resource and inshallah going from there. But uh, to, to begin, uh, so to begin with the lifestyle of the Prophet um, we'll, we'll start with this hadith that we have shared in previous sessions, but in different different parts of these hadith, this hadith uh, in this tradition that's narrated. Um, and, you know, we've covered, because it's such a long tradition, it's the tradition of um, Al-Hasan, uh, the son of Ali, who, who talks about his uh, the, his father describing, um, you know, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, him and his brother, uh, Imam Hussein, asking about uh, the Prophet Sallallahu and the mannerisms of the Prophet Sallallahu And so one of the one of the portions of this hadith is with respect to uh, Al-Hasan Al asking and, you know, he's or Al-Hasan narrating um, that uh, Hussein had said that I asked my father about the entry of the Prophet Sallallahu into his home. How did he enter his home? And so uh, uh, he, Ali, said when Allah's messenger returned to his residence or betook himself to his residence, he divided his entry into three sections. He divided coming home into three different parts. Uh, and he divided his home life into three different parts. That one was a part for Allah, one was a part for his family, and one was a part for his own sake. And amongst his own part that he has, that he would divide his section between himself and the people. And so he was uh, assigning that in particular to the common folk, and he was not keeping anything from them. His conduct in the section or in the part of the community included preference for people of excellent merit with his permission, and its uh, allotment according to the value of their excellent merit in the religion. For among them was the one burdened with one need, and among them was one burdened with two needs, and among them was one burdened with multiple needs. And he would therefore preoccupy himself with them and preoccupy them with that which would benefit them and the community, including questioning them about it and informing them of what would be appropriate for them. And he would invite folks to share what he's sharing with them uh, to those who are not present. So just to break this down a little bit, first and foremost, the lifestyle of the Prophet ﷺ, the day of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, is you can see in his home life is broken down into three sections. It's a very intentional um, kind of uh, setting of a boundary with respect to 
uh, one's time, but uh, to, to use one's home life uh, for not just oneself or not just one's family or not just one's work or not just one's pleasure, but to be able to use uh, that time very intentionally to where the Prophet has divided his home life in three parts. The first part being for worship of Allah or for Allah's sake. The other part is for his family's sake and what the family needs. And the other part is a section for himself. And even in himself, he has a, a half and half. And so um, he has his part, but then he has the, uh, the people who are in need of him. And so still while he's in his own residence, while he's in his own home, he opens his home for that portion for people to come and uh, take part and, and and to ask and to you know be able to converse with him but just to kind of see on this this level that it's very interesting we sometimes say oh it's a Prophet used to do one third, one third, one third, like that's great. But we don't really dive into the significance of that. Seeing that the Prophet understanding, you know, the the significance of worship, the significance of committing oneself to Allah for Allah's sake, but then the that same third is given to a family, to give into the Prophet's family, uh, to his to his wives, um, to uh the people, to his daughters, to all the folks that are there. And so just kind of like seeing how. Uh, psychologically and how spiritually the benefit is being lifted up with respect to the care for one's family on that same level of, of, of being uh, present for Allah's sake and worshiping Allah. And then also to uh, keep in mind, have a section for yourself. It doesn't have to consume the whole day. It can be something that is, uh, that is uh, very minor, but it's an intentional part that you keep a part to yourself. And then uh, within that part, you can do what you would kind of like. And then the Prophet has some space that you have you have him doing it for himself, but then you have him also dedicating that part to the people. So kind of getting an idea that if we were to come with the process of into his home, that he would have these different things that he, he feels he needs to fulfill and that he has to uh, dedicate himself to. So it probably wouldn't just be all over the place, be very intentional with respect to the time he allocates uh, with the limited number of hours that there are to be able to intentionally divide it up amongst uh, his commitments, but also uh, for uh, the sake of Allah, for the sake of his family, for the sake of uh, other people, and uh, not not least amongst them himself. And so, uh, with respect to you know th this kind of just being the holistic element of how the Prophet would break down his day or how he would spend his day. Uh, we, we kind of now go into different narrations about the Prophet uh, if he, uh, whether he's eating, how he would be dressed, all these different things um, that, that, that come up. But let's say the Prophet has, uh, you know, brought us into his home and he invites us to eat uh, something with him and he invites us for, for some food. And, and these uh, following narrations will talk a lot about um, how he uh, would eat and what, what he would kind of, uh, what, what his, uh, you know, kind of, uh, advice would be with respect to what was his prophetic practice. And so the first hadith narrates um, from Malik ibn Dinar that says the Prophet Sallallahu would never eat his fill of either bread or meat unless he was eating with other people. Um, thinking about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi would never, uh, you know, you have the um, this idea that we sometimes eat and we leave thinking that I'm so full, you know, I'm never, I'm, I'm, I'm just like up to here, like with respect to my food, the Prophet ﷺ would never uh, eat to his fill, would never uh, go to that point where he would feel uh, completely satiated or even oversatiated. And so to think of the Prophet ﷺ being who he is and being in the space that he is, uh, never once kind of getting to a point where he it has uh, overeaten, that he's always mindful that regardless of the hardships he's going through, regardless of the situations he's living through, he is still mindful of this diet. He's mindful of what he is taking in, but he's also conscientious of uh, what not to take in and what not to get caught up in, uh, especially whether in good times or in, uh, in harder times. Um, and then uh, in additionally, the uh, uh, the wife of the Prophet Aisha anha, shares that the family of Muhammad never ate their fill of bread two days in a row up until the soul of the Prophet was taken. So the Prophet would uh, barely eat, uh, you know, and his family would never have like you know a uh, f like a full meal per se or eat to their fill. Um, you know, up until that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu passed away, that he, this was something that was a part and parcel of his life. He never, um, you know, just was uh, was gluttonous with respect to that, never overate. Uh, and it's very interesting to see as well, Ibn Abbas, 
uh, sharing as well that the messenger of Allah, and this is the nephew of the Prophet Sallallahu that the messenger of Allah and his family would spend consecutive nights extremely hungry and would not find anything to eat for supper. And the most common form of bread that they would eat was barley bread. So thinking about this aspect that not just the Prophet Sallallahu but his family as well, they would really be in, in, in a serious kind of a hardship that, but this would not be something that deterred them from still being present to their community, being present to their families, being present to uh, Allah, being present to the needs of others that they, and they, and they would model this, that oftentimes we see, especially in modern society and, and even in, you know, uh, classical or medieval society and, and, and throughout that when you have uh, individuals who are kind of designated as the the power holders within a community, the the royalty, the royal family, whoever it may be, the folks who are designated, uh, you sometimes see you have that barrier between them. Their lifestyle is different. The food they eat is different. The road that they drive on is different. The way that they just kind of go through life is so different. Their weddings are different. All these things are are very different with respect to that. But you see the Prophet Sallallahu family and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were people who were right in the trenches of the struggles and the same issues facing their community. So if their community members were going hungry, that was something that they would be able to relate to. They would not be like, oh, you know, we'll just pray for you and hope that, you know, uh, and that Allah fills your stomach or whatnot. No, they would be, they would also go to sleep hungry. They would also feel that that difficulty. And, and you know, so, so you see how the Prophet was not just operating from a lens of moral righteousness and then kind of on a pedestal, but the Prophet was very much uh, speaking from the experience when, when he spoke of feeding the hungry, when he spoke of, you know, the, the uh, necessity to be mindful of what one takes in and, and, and you know, how one eats and, and, and to be mindful of the blessing of food, you see the Prophet is very much this is a lived experience for him. So the Prophet and his family, you know, this would be something that is a part and parcel of how they go uh, go about with respect to um, you know their their diet, but not but also just in effect you see the the humility and the modesty that the Prophet some has every right to not kind of experience that kind of hunger, not go uh, days kind of without his fill or his family's fill or, uh, you know, not have to worry about finding anything to eat for supper. You know, the people around him would would gladly uh, join hands and, and, and come and say and help with respect to that. But you see the Prophet being very mindful of this. And there, there's a, a really deep lesson to kind of show us the character of the Prophet is one that goes beyond this holistic kind of humility and, and more of a philosophical sense and, and not thinking about how does it practically look like. And, and this is one of those ways where uh, in that modesty, in that humility, the Prophet understands that he's not the only hungry one in his community. It's likely that most of the people at this time are also experiencing this. Uh, and the Prophet doesn't make it a point to feel like, oh, because I'm Prophet of Allah, I need to have these basic things. Like, I need nourishment just to like continue. No, the Prophet would walk alongside his community, even when they may not see it. And these are uh, narrations are often re related, especially with his family or with the people who knew him. Um, and then uh, you have others that that uh, would observe it as well, that the Prophet would be very mindful. Um, but if he's eating with other people, he would he would eat with them. He would he would make them uh, you know, eat, eat as they do, um, and 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 be with them. But again, with with his proper limits and 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 the mindfulness. Um, so, uh, in addition, in it, with respect to his lifestyle, you know, we're going to kind of bounce around with different hadith. So, uh, we may we're not just going to focus on topic to topic to topic. So it's just the food, just this, just this. We'll kind of give a good mix of it. So as we're sitting amongst the process, and we're eating with the process, and we notice that the process is. Uh, you know, very, very uh, doesn't doesn't have a lot to maybe offer with respect to that, but has um, very simple things to be able to offer. Uh, and you can see that the portions are not huge, but uh, you see the blessings in the modesty of this, but you also see the process of being, uh, you know, present to uh, to our needs as well, and not just uh, his own needs or his family's needs, but the guests that he entertains. And so we may also see was the Prophet wearing? Sometimes we talk about who the Prophet was with respect to his looks. What did he look like? But uh, we sometimes think, what what, is, what what does the Prophet look like on the outside? Was he wearing? Um, you know, what 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 would he uh, be dressed in? And uh, the narrations go uh, with respect to this first one that Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said that uh, when Allah's messenger would put on a new garment. 
he would call it by its name and then he would say, uh, oh Allah, praise be to you as you have clothed me with it and I beg you for its goodness and the goodness of what it has been made for. And I take refuge with you from the evil uh, of it and the evil of what it's been made for. So you just see this intentionality. Um, this doesn't necessarily describe the Rafsasam's clothing per se, but uh, if he was to get a new shirt or a new um, you know, kameez or any kind of new garment that the intentionality that is there. You see the Prophet is very present with respect to every action in life, that even if it's something inanimate, like a shirt, or if it's something that is just a plate of food, the Prophet uh, makes a point to honor it uh, and honor Allah by uh, giving thanks to Allah and, and, and offering a prayer for something even as, as simple as that. And so just think that if Prophet is doing this with respect to offering the sacred um, you know, prayer and offering this kind of presence for a garment, what would the Prophet be with respect to treating other people or guests? And so just think about that, that uh, if we were to give Prophet a new garment, if we were to bring something for him, the uh, prayers that the Prophet would offer, that they would not be taken in and just like, oh, you know, what's this? And just kind of tossed in and, you know, collecting dust on the side. This would be something that would be taken in, but also as a, as a way for the Prophet to be able to uh, praise Allah. And, 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 you know, the Prophet loved uh, to praise Allah and the Prophet uh, in, in, in lifted up for his community to continue this as well. Uh, and of course, you know, we are encouraged and, 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 you know, commanded to to continue to do this, but this is a practical way of that every aspect in life that we find something to be grateful for, we find something to lift up, and you see that in this aspect as we're sitting with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, finding any little thing to be uh, to to connect back to Allah and give praise, even if there's not that there's still that reason just to give send praise uh, upon the process uh, upon uh, Allah and to give praise to Allah. Um, you also see what 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 like you know apart from uh, the shirt as well that that the process we may gift the process a, a shirt and we see him respond like this we also may see uh as we had narrated i think in a previous session that uh, another narration that comes from amir ibn hurait shares that the process um would uh i saw the process um pray in sandals that had new souls sewn into the old one so remember the hadith of Aisha who was asked that what was the Prophet doing in his home? What did he used to do? And you know how she said that he's a man among men. He would, uh, you know, look through his clothes for lice. He would stitch them and uh, repair his garments. He would milk his sheep and he would prepare his own food or he would serve himself. So thinking about this as well, that when we see the Prophet uh, home and the, the, the simple lifestyle that the Prophet is living, uh, that we also see that the Prophet Sallallahu is not, uh, you know, just has like uh, the, the, the latest and newest things. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam isn't at the forefront with respect to having all those uh, garments and, 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 you know, goods and all this fashion or whatnot. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has what he needs to kind of get by. And even then he has something old, but he's, uh, he's constantly uh, mending these. He's, he's, he's making sure he's ma make, maximizing his utility of these things. So he, whether it's shoes or whether it's his garments, that there's this very intentional presence. And so we see, um, you know, like I said, the Prophet would have uh, a very strong prerogative to just be able to have the best of the best. But uh, there's there's a prophetic model in this. There's an example. There's that humility and modesty that's emphasized in this lifestyle of the Prophet to be able to uh, see the benefit in everything that Allah has given us, but also to be able to uh, see how can we make the most of what we've been given. And apart from uh, the shoes of the Prophet um, again, we, we're, we're noticing the Prophet um, eating, how the Prophet um, eating, uh, it's related that when he would eat, he would lick uh, his three blessed fingers, that he has his thumb, his index, and his middle fingers, and that he would um, you know, make sure that no food is wasted in a sense, that if uh, food was provided to him or served to him, he would eat of it. If he didn't like it, he wouldn't, he wouldn't touch it. He would leave it. Um, but if he was eating of it and would eat with his hands, then he would uh, make sure that he cleans out his plate and that he cleans uh, any, any trace of that. And so you see the process of them as uh, you know, making sure that none is wasted. And again, think psychologically, we may see like finger licking as something that we're maybe not uh, accustomed to in certain spaces, but we, we you know, uh, it's, it's not uh, that odd or that, that strange, but also thinking of it from 
the, the, the prophetic practice as well of this is a family and this is a person who never really ate to his fill. This is a, a people who uh, daily would experience hunger and, you know, not the kind of hunger that we sometimes feel in Ramadan uh, where we're just like, you know, just like, oh, we're, you know, we haven't had food for a while and we're really hungry, but sustained hunger to really know what it means to be hungry and, and not have food and not have to uh, fill to maybe have your fill for the next day. So taking a look at how the process of valued even something that would be just like some residue or something that's left over um, that might be on one's finger to just see the value of that with proportion to what one's been taking in. And so just to see the value uh, of food that, that is there. The other narration here as well, uh, Anas ibn Malik tells us that the Prophet never ate upon a small table or from a small plate, um, and thin bread was never baked for him. And so uh, the narrator had asked that, what did they eat on? Um, and he was told that they used to eat on round mats, that they used to have very collective space. And so, uh, again, it, it, there's, there's, there's a cultural aspect to it, but there's also just the prophetic aspect of uh, the Prophet being able to kind of eat in a shared environment. So it wasn't that the process of, as, as we sometimes see in our society in different spaces where you have the leader is eating at the head of the table or the, fam the head of the family is eating at the head of the table or in any space here, um, and they have their own seat, they have their own plate, they have their own space here, but the process of sitting amongst people. We talked last time about the gatherings of the process. Of he would come into a gathering, he would sit where there's space. He wouldn't say, hey, move over, I'm sitting right here, this is my space. So imagine that translating into his eating environment that we're just gathered around with him and we're all sharing from what we have here that there, there's these, these round mats that we're sitting on and we're just taking from what we have um, and on the subject of food as well another companion narrates that you know or I, I believe this was um, you know someone who had gone actually to visit um, uh, Aisha Rodila and, uh, and after the Prophet had passed away and so uh, one one day I went to visit a uh, visit Aisha Aisha and she asked for some food to be brought to me. And then she said, I do not eat my fill of food. Uh, and, then, uh, and then I wish to cry, except that I cry. Uh, and I asked, and the narrator says, I asked, why is that? And she replied, I remember the condition in which the messenger of Allah left this world. And by Allah, he never ate his fill of bread and meat twice in the same day. So again, you see this kind of lesson, this kind of example of the Prophet lingering on uh, and lasting in the memory uh, of his family members, of his wives, that how he used to eat, that they, they were so conscientious of eating to their fill because knowing the Prophet never ate to his fill. And that it brings tears to their eyes that uh, a lot of times you'll see these reports of the companions, uh, you know, once the Muslim uh, community goes into new uh, nations and new spaces and, and accumulates a lot of wealth, accumulates a lot of resources, the, the, the companions can't help but find tears, can't help but find just like, just, uh, you know, just this, this, this kind of sadness that the process of never had any of this and who are we to enjoy this? And so again, seeing how the process of some played a role in their life, even after he passed with respect to uh, checking them in their modesty, checking them in their humility and making them remember to stay grounded and, and not get caught up in the pleasures of this world or not get caught up in that which uh, maybe may feel easy or maybe is easy. Uh, it's easy just to kind of fill your fill uh, and eat what you'd like and to take part in what's given to you, but to mindfully operate it and to remember that the process of some never had any of this. So do we really need to go to that uh, extent? Uh, another narration ha uh, lifts up by uh, an numan ibn Bashir that says that, do you not have uh, what you want in the way of food and drink? And I have seen, uh, with respect, he's narrating to other, other companions that, do you not have what you want in the way of food or drink? That I have seen your prophet at times unable to find even the lowest quality of dates with which to fill his stomach. That, you know, you see this invocation that, uh, you know, when, when you're talking about companions who probably have come into a lot of wealth or are now eating exotic foods or different foods and coming in, that you see this uh, callback to the process sometimes time that he would be someone that would, uh, you know, just be unable to find even like some low quality dates. He would be, he would be someone experiencing very real hunger, a daily kind of a hunger um, that would go by. And even when he would, um, have moments of celebration or have events of celebration, 
that he would uh, be modest in those. And so we're, we're sitting with the process some, we, we see that the meal is very modest as well, that he, he would never, you know, as, as Aisha related, that never ate his fill of bread and meat twice in the same day. So very simple kind of food that's, that's put out from it. And we'll talk a little bit more in future sessions about what the process I'm like to eat and specific things like that. But just imagine um, in terms of this hadith here uh, or this tradition that we see the process some um, near, uh, you know, giving a banquet or giving a walima for uh, his wife, Safiya. And to the community, this community dinner he's offering, but it's offered just with dry dates and porridge made from wheat or barley. And so imagine that this is uh, a meal given to the community for celebration and imagine a simple meal being provided for us. And there's no shame in that. The, the process of lifting up that, that significance of each of these things, whether it's just a couple dates and some bread or a little bit of meat, that uh, there, there's not a blessing so much in the, quant uh, in the quantity, but in the quality of, of what is being given as well. So we see as we're sitting with the Prophet somewhere, we're in this space, we see how the Prophet is uh, eating, how he's uh, mindful of what he eats, um, how he uh, is not eating to his fill, and also with respect to his family, how, how they are also mindful of this. And, you know, just, just thinking in that space that there's that blessing that, that, that's occurring there as well. But then we're also looking around um, and we're looking at his bed, we're looking at uh, maybe his drinking vessel, we're seeing what's around this place. And there's many narrations that talk about how um, people would come into the home of the process. I mean, it's just not, it's just, it's not like a mansion or anything. It's very simple um, kind of a, a home at that time that there's not much uh, in, in the way. And you can kind of look up some recreations when you look up uh, Prophet uh, home or house. And you can see these recreations that have been done by uh, different um, scholars and designers and whatnot to, to kind of get an idea of what the Prophet lived like. And so when we look at, uh, we're looking around, um, there's a narration by Aisha that says that the bed of the messenger of the process, the bed of the messenger of Allah was uh, that on which you would sleep, that was a uh, tanned hide and its stuffing or its, um, you know, fill was of palm tree fibers. So the bed of the process uh, in which you would sleep was just, you know, a tanned hide and its uh, stuffing was that of a palm tree fiber that uh, we have other yeah, narration that it uh, it was basically just these these palm fibers at, at the base of it. And, um, you know, when the Prophet ﷺ would get up, you would be able to see those marks that uh, it's not a sleep number bed. It's not a tempur bed. It's something that's uh, a very, you know, kind of harsh, uh, harsh thing to kind of sleep on. It's, it's maybe not the most comfortable thing. And uh, Aisha also relates that she was asked, how was the mattress of the process of how was his, his bed in your home? And she said that it consisted of tanned hides stuffed with fibers. Um, and his wife Hafsa was also asked, what was the mattress of the process of in your home? And she said that it was coarse woolen fabric that we folded in two in order to sleep. And then one night I said, uh, if it's uh, two folds were four, it would be softer for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi So let me uh, fold it for him into four folds. And when he woke up in the morning, he responded to Hafsa. I said, what, what did you do? Uh, what did you spread out for me to tonight? And she said that, oh, we it's your mattress. We just accept folded it four times instead of two, uh, that it would be softer. And the process of said, restore it to its original conditions. Its softness has prevented me from performing my uh, ritual prayer tonight. And so you see the process of uh, may have just in this space, uh, you know, with respect to getting uh, into a, a space of leisure or comfort um, and, and, and admonishing uh, the household or reminding them that, hey, you know, this is like good and all, but like the uh, you know this this isn't what uh, what not just what I want because there's there's a purpose behind it. It's not I'm not just sleeping on it because for the sake of like it's the only thing I can find or it's just there. But there's a wisdom to it that uh, I I don't get too attached to this bed. Uh, this bed is just where I come to sleep for a little bit. But my commitment and my attachment is to Allah. So how do we design our environment to be one where we don't? get super attached that we have like our phones if we lose it it's the end of the world for many of us and so uh you know when we when we have this uh, idea with respect to the possessions that we have how do we operate with respect to not getting carried away uh and, and seeing that if we don't have them what will happen here and so looking at how the process of them used each of these uh items that he owned as a way to uh as a way to be able to connect back to Allah but also not get caught up in in their in their um, you know, in their, in their 
uh, their material. And so you see uh, that the bed of the process system was like that. Uh, we also see that when the process system would sleep, that we could expect that if he said like, hey, you know, stay with me or just like, you know, let's like, you know, just have you uh, stay with us for the night or whatever it may be, that the process system would uh, be someone that is very intentional, just not with just his food, um, which he would, you know, of course, uh, you know, take and, and, and bless and uh, remember with the name of Allah and eat with his right hand and, and all these different things that he would also do similar with his sleep, that he would be someone that would recite different prayers, different uh, Quran verses, different things uh, before going to sleep and when waking up. So very intentional type of uh, space that he, his, his life was very much filled with these short prayers and these uh, connections to Allah and these invocations and these verses being recited actively. So his faith played a heavy part with respect to his everyday life. It was not divorced from it, but it also did not preoccupy him in that space where he's not able to provide for other people. As we saw, he spends his day uh, in, in, in thirds and so has that part for Allah, has that part for his family, has that part for uh, himself and his people. And so you see how this all factors in though, but the consistent thread of having that connection to Allah. Additionally, we see in the worship of the Prophet and we'll talk a little bit more about this in detail in the, in the future session, but uh, we, we have the famous hadith from Aisha that talks about how the Prophet would pray until his feet would get swollen. And she would ask him, why do you burden yourself uh, when Allah has already forgiven you and your uh, your former sins, your uh, sins to come? And, you know, he replied that, shall I not be a thankful servant? Should I not be grateful? So just seeing the Prophet worship is also one that's not just with precision, but it's one that's done with sincerity, even if it comes at a little bit of an expense to himself, that he uh, is lifting up this, this humility that, uh, I, I, even though I'm the prophet of Allah, even though I'm, I'm in this space, uh, should I not be grateful? Do I, do I, you know, just kind of squander this? And so thinking about how the Prophet would worship, but also the essence of how he worships, how he sleeps, how he eats, these have, these are all having the same intentionality. Uh, they're not divorced from one another. He wouldn't just eat in a, a certain way, but not pray in that spiritual way or not uh, sleep in that same intentional way. He would be very intentional and uh, consistent across the space. Um, and then, you know, we see uh, Aisha also talking about, apart from his worship, uh, that uh, the Messenger of Allah and I would bathe from a single container that you see in the home of the Prophet We see his bed, we see, you know, a simple mat, which we're sitting on to eat. Uh, we see a small, uh, like a vessel in the corner. We want one, he has a vessel for his water and he what he drinks and everything that comes about. But then he also has uh, just a, a small container for um, his, 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 his bathing. And then that wouldn't, he wouldn't be separate from his wife. He would have that uh, for her as well, that they, they would be a very simple with respect to this. And, and it's important to note how the Prophet, how this previous hadith we had shared earlier with respect to the mattress, you see another wife of the Prophet Hafsa sharing very similarly that there was uh, you know, a very similar mattress that he had in her quarters. And so having this consistency across um, his, his wives, but also he, he was not, um, you know, he, he, he was not someone who uh, did not appear uh, to be the same person that that we would see in one setting, that even if we were in the home of the process um, with respect to uh, with one wife, um, that he wouldn't be uh, extremely different in a different space to where another wife would just have nothing. And, and you know, he would he would he would apply that same kind of uh, consistency to these uh, to the to across the board with his relationships. And so you see additionally that uh, the process um, is also someone in, in not just his appearance and his lifestyle, but who would be intentionally um, taking care of himself. Uh, I should, or Anas ibn Malik relates that the Prophet would frequently apply oil to his head and he would comb his beard. So you see the Prophet taking care of himself. He's not disheveled, that his lifestyle consists of him taking care of himself, making sure his appearance uh, is, is, is uh, looking good and that he's not, um, you know, just kind of uh, letting go of himself, that he's also taking care of himself. So his lifestyle consists of him uh, being present to himself, not just in taking his time and just kind of relaxing and just doing uh, you know what, whatever is there for him, but also to, to take care of himself. We talked about how the Prophet was someone who was not, his stomach did not go past his chest, that he was, he would maintain himself in that way. So his diet would take, would be in that aspect, but also just from a beauty standpoint, he would take care of himself uh, cosmetically in a sense, not that he would be, uh, you know, applying all these different things or whatnot, but he would do things that were for the benefit of his body um, and for uh, that which he had been blessed with, but also as an example, 
example for other people to take care of that which you've been given, uh, that if you've been given a nice home, a nice vehicle, uh, a, a good family or whatnot, you have a, you're a steward for them. You're to, you are to take care of them. You are to may, be responsible for these things. And similarly, even for his hair or even for his beard, he would be, be mindful of taking care of, of those things. And uh, in, in, in respect that, let's say, if the Prophet was uh, you know, inviting us to pray as well, or inviting us to uh, kind of just, uh, just, you know, wash up or clean up before we, uh, you know, go for worship or anything like that. Um, Aisha relates that the process of would always start from the right side in his purification. And when he was purifying um, and in combing, when he was combing and in wearing of his sandals when putting them on. So that uh, the process of would start from his right side in his purification, when he would be purifying himself, that in his combing, when he's, uh, you know, uh, when he is uh, combing his hair, and in him wearing his sandals when you put them on. So you imagine all this intentionality that if it goes from the direction which you comb your hair, if it goes from the way you put on your sandal, if it goes from the way that you start your purification, it all begins uh, on the right side. So you see the process of this, again, intentionality across the spaces, from the spiritual to the personal to the um, you know, social, all these different areas are consistent and they're linked. Um, you have the narration of as well with the Prophet Sallallahu when he would go to sleep, uh, he, he would relate that uh, apply antimony before, uh, or an antimony before going uh, to sleep, that it's this cold uh, that you kind of see, um, uh, you know, the, with respect, respect to kind of like a mascara in a sense that uh, apply this, this, uh, this antimony before going to sleep for it clears the vision and it makes the eyelashes grow. And so uh, just again, th some of these practices are, 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 are what the Prophet um, um, would do. And, you know, just uh, uh, the, the, at that time as well, just looking contextually at those things, it may not be something that we do, but seeing uh, and honoring the, uh, the example and the doing of them by the Prophet So uh, looking at how um, the Prophet would go to sleep, he would also do it in a way to take care of himself. He would uh, not just kind of go to sleep as a way of unintentionally like, oh my gosh, I'm tired and just knock out. He would say his prayers. He would say his du'as. He would, say, he would read um, his Quran verses. He would uh, read his chapters. And then uh, he would also do things to take care of himself um, so that, and, and for benefiting his body. Apart from um, this aspect, we kind of talked a little bit about uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi clothing. We'll talk a little bit more about that here, that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu uh, his, his his favorite thing, his favorite kind of garment was a shirt, that it, it was the kameez. Um, and he uh, would advise his community that wear white clothes, that let your living ones wear them and shroud your deceased in them, for they are the best uh, among the best of your clothes. And thinking not just from a color standpoint that, oh, hey, white stands out, it's nice. Utility standpoint as well, wear white clothes, let your living ones wear them and shroud your deceased ones in them, for they are amongst the best of your clothes. That uh, being very economical, the process is not saying don't waste your resources, don't just go buy them all and just have all these different varieties. Wear that which is, which is also practical, that if you have a white shirt and you don't have a lot of uh, resources or whatnot, and you have someone pass away in your family, you have to shroud them, use that as well. Just, you know, you'd be able to uh, utilize, and, and we see this logic of how uh, with respect to the Prophet of sandals, that uh, the same old soul, but they have new uh, straps kind of attached to her. The, the new souls are attached to uh, the old straps that you have this reusing of it until they are not able to be used again. And um, we see this uh, example lifted up where one of the companions of the Prophet of gave him a pair of plain black leather shoes. And so he worn them, uh, he wore them as well as a, uh, a gown or a jubba. And so he wore those shoes and uh, the jubba until they were perforated and worn and torn, that he would wear it uh, until uh, they were too basically uh, dust. And it said that, that you see people say like, hey, I'm gonna drive this car uh, basically to the ground. I'm just driving it until the wheels fall off or whatnot in the process of intentionally wearing his clothes, doing uh, wearing his garments, all these different things until they reach their, uh, their end. And even in that end, finding ways to repair them to extend that life, but really using these things uh, not just as on whimsically or just kind of at, at, at a whim, but to be able to use them very intentionally. Um, and then again, we see just how we would see the Prophet ﷺ putting on his garment. He offers a prayer, how he would put on his shoes. We see Prophet ﷺ starting with the right, 
advising his community that uh, start with the right and let it be, uh, let the right be the first one that is worn. And then when you take off your shoe and you remove it, um, you know, do it with your left foot that let it be the la the right side be the last one that is removed. And so you see this very intentional space the process of this. Uh, it's also uh, narrated that uh, the process of was uh, seen in the mosque, oftentimes in what's called a kurfusa position. They, uh, he basically like has his his knees kind of like this, and has like you see people kind of sitting like this, but would sit in the mosque kind of just very humbly, very very modestly, just sitting like that. And so imagine him as well uh, in in our gathering here, sitting very humbly, not sitting like you know taking up all the space. He'd be just sitting very uh, presently, very humbly uh, in a space that would cause awe. You know, companions would relate that they would walk in and they would just be amazed at this person that who's the prophet of Allah, yet he's sitting very humbly. He's not sitting like a king or anything. Uh, he would also be someone who would be able to entertain with you. He would be someone who would joke with his family, joke with his companions, but in a uh, healthy and in a truthful way. Um, he would be somebody that would uh, recline. Uh, he would be, he would kind of just, you know, if you have a cushion, he would be able to recline with it. So just imagine him being very comfortable in that space, but he would not eat when he would re be reclined. And so and be very intentional with how he is in different spaces. And we sometimes, you know, if we go to a restaurant or whatnot, we'll, you know, we're reclining if they have floor seating and, you know, we just kind of uh, take things in with process some understanding that, uh, you know, the, the proper etiquette for certain things. And so just imagining that when we're with the process and we're eating or in the home of the process, and he's not at that rigid. He's not someone who's like, you know, you feel like you're on eggshells with. He's someone who will, uh, you know, uh, be, meet you where you are and help make you feel make you feel comfortable in his home. And part of that is just uh, body language. And so when he's just reclining back, it makes you a little more comfortable. Hey, we, I can I can ease up a little bit as well. Um, we see the Prophet Sussum in his lifestyle as well, uh, not just. Um, eat, how he would eat at gatherings and being there for other people. He would be invited by uh, a lot of people, um, but he would bring other people into his home. He would have this this constant companionship this uh, that that is existing between his companions um, and their families and uh, having a very strong sense of community care, very embedded in the community. But he would also be someone who accepts invitations, that he would not decline invitations, even if it was for a very simple or humble meal, that he would be able to go. He would encourage that as well. Um, he has this intentional practice that emanates throughout. Um, and then, uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit more when we talk about the worship of, of the process. And we also want to talk about just real quick mention in, in closing here, the fasting of the process and that, uh, you know, the process of would, would fast uh, as well and, and regularly fast. And so in his, part of his lifestyle would also include him fasting regularly, whether during the week or during the month. And you have uh, how the Prophet just operated with respect to um, uh, his, his, that he wouldn't show that he's fasting, he wouldn't show that he's hungry. We see uh, a, a different hadith that's not mentioned in the in the Shamail, but you, it's a very famous one where um, they are digging the trench in preparation for the battle of the trench or uh, Khandak, and um, you know the companions are starving and they lift up their shirts saying, "Look how many like stones I have!" Like you know, and the Prophet lifts it up and he's got double the stones that that are there, and that he he also is hungry, but he's not saying anything about it, and so just. As, as we kind of wrap this up in a way, uh, what, what the takeaway we would like for you to have and what takeaway uh, that we can draw from this is that imagining ourselves in the process of home, but seeing someone who is consistent, someone who is very present, someone who is intentional, and someone who uh, is treating that which he has been given, whether his shirt, whether his hair, whether his beard, his physical features, his family, his various abilities, and being thankful to Allah for them and being present to them and giving them their due by giving the time that they're due. That, hey, I've been given a beard, I've been given hair, I've been given kids, I've been given a wife, I've been given uh, you know, at least a home to sleep in, I've been given these things. And uh, the, the aspect of the process of spending each of his, uh, his time at home divided into these spaces or giving every person or every entity essentially it's due that when Allah, uh, the worship time for Allah comes, that's the process of time for worship. When it comes time for the family, 
that's the family time. They are they are owed that time, and the Prophet sees this as a sacred obligation, and so should we. And then when it comes time for myself and for other people, that's my time there. And in the time for myself, it's not just to sit back, relax, and just knock out and, and not worry about anything else. It's a time for us to uh, focus on our, our own physical bodies as well, that we take care of ourselves uh, as well as the Prophet some did. So what we take away from the lifestyle of the Prophet some is that regardless of it, it was one that was embodied of modesty, embodied of humility, was not divorced from uh, any of these things, was one that uh, was not filled with excess, was one that was moderate and even uh, limited in a sense, but one that was intentional through and through, whether in the faith practices of worship, whether in the communal aspect of relating to people, or whether in the relational aspects of just being there for one's family, as well as being present to oneself. So inshallah, we'll conclude with this. And uh, in the future sessions, we'll also be covering the uh, Prophet uh, different attributes and uh, just kind of seeing where the Prophet is with respect to, uh, you know, not just his character, not just all these different aspects of the Prophet but also uh, just how some of the more peculiarities with respect to his life. So in the next session, we'll be covering more so his mannerisms that, that, that are maybe a little more peculiar to him. And so we'll kind of go from there, but inshallah, uh, I hope that this has been of benefit. And just again, imagine that presence of being with the Prophet and what that lifestyle is like. It's a very humble, very austere, very uh, simple lifestyle. Uh, we may say that's very impoverished, but it's it's not, it, it may be impoverished from a sense of a worldly standpoint, but it's very wealthy and very rich from the spiritual and from the relational and the communal uh, and humane standpoint and, and, and just from the human element. So see the Prophet maybe as someone who's not worldly wealthy in that aspect and his lifestyle that's not one that's consisted of wealth in in the material sense but one that is overflowing with wealth in the spiritual benefit in the uh communal and in the relational uh and in the 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 loving and uh, all of that which is in the uh the quantitative sphere uh of the process um, in his example so we'll conclude with that and until next time assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh